Hello and welcome. I'm Gohar Raza and you are watching Eureka. Theoretical physics, astrophysics, theory of relativity, plasma physics is given a task which is mundane, developing sensors or cleaning a chamber or he is called upon by the nation to design future of the country, that is future of science and technology. He can do it because it is the same creativity that goes into all these creative endeavors. Today, we have Dr. Prabhat Ranjan with us. Welcome to Rajya Sabha channel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very thankful that you gave time sure. for Eureka. Let's go back. When did you decide that research is going to be your destiny? From your school days, actually, we asked my classmates. They always knew I was going to be in research. So it was a decision that I had taken subconsciously during my school days. Only thing I did was to continue to stick to that and not change my mind. And my school is famous for maximum successful candidates in UPSC. So when my brothers, whether my friends, everybody went to that, but I was one who stuck to my task, which was to do research. Your father and mother didn't come from background of science. Right. Yet you decided in this school right. that you will be doing research and that too in physics and you were firm about it. Right. What motivated you? I'm not sure what motivated me at that time. I used to like mathematics very much. Somewhere I felt that I need The to language of science. Right. I need to relate to real world. And physics is the best combination of mathematics and real world. And so I stuck to that. But I did change. I, changed. I wanted to become a particle physicist when I was in school. But then as you, you know, knew about particle physics in a school? Yes. In fact, I used to give lectures on that, elementary particles during my school days. And Who but, prompted you? It was a teacher or? Uh, we had a very good library. Mm -hmm. And my elder brother was also in the same school. So we, he was also looking after the science club. So there was some discussion on that. But slowly I talked about Ramanujam once. Then I talked elementary particles. And I used to follow these books in library and so on. So it excited me at that time. You don't remember any teacher who motivated you? Uh, I don't remember the teachers per se, but all the teachers are very close to me even till today if they are alive. Some of them are more than 80 years of age. But they did support me at all the time. And even if I did some mistake, they would not scold me knowing that this fellow is interested in research. They did encourage me. But there are many such incidents where I might have made a mistake or done something which uh, you know, might have broken an instrument. But they did not say that don't do it, you know, encourage me to do that. That is very important. Otherwise, mostly we are asked to stop doing things rather than you know, take that extra step. In my childhood, I was known the torch breakers, every time a new torch will come in my house, I will open it up and <laughs> take out things into it. So you that broke is toys of, yeah, right. <laughs> so throughout your childhood. So my family also supported in that way. They didn't say, <laughs> scold me, stop that. The school also supported in that sense. So, but I don't remember a particular uh, person that was interested. All of them together. Did that. Yeah, but, uh, IIT Kharagpur, um, uh, when you uh, appeared for the exam and you were selected, right. uh, was a turning point in your life. Right. Uh, you were forced, almost forced to join in engineering and that to electrical engineering. Right. Uh, how did you uh, yeah, so actually, cope up with What that? happened was at the counseling time, I was said that you are making mistake, don't take physics. And I was... Why did they say that it's a mistake? Somehow they felt that I don't know what is going on and maybe I just some fancy that I have for physics. Maybe later I would regret. So they thought that it will be better to warn me and ask me to do engineering. And, uh, uh, and these were professors of IIT Kharagpur? These professors, not IIT Kharagpur, it was all the different IITs. That time it was manual counseling, so different IITs were represented. Okay. And, and they would suggest that which courses you take, which program at which places, depending on the vacancy. So when I said physics and I went in Kharagpur, they said that why didn't you take something else? BHU IIT people said that you take electronics with us and so on. And then uh, when I was not agreeing to that, uh, they called my father saying that this fellow is making a mistake. 
and so he should take engineering. But he's, they said that if I take engineering, I can change to physics later. Vice versa would not be possible. So to get out of that tricky situation, I said, okay, let me take engineering. So they said that take You got sick of <laughs> yeah, their advice. Because <laughs> they're all sitting there. Everybody else was waiting yeah. outside, you know, because uh, the vacancies are there. And that time it was not internet based. Finally, I said that, okay, give me, uh, this is electrical engineering, give me that. And uh, I went out. And then when I joined IIT Kharagpur, the very first day, I gave an application that please change me to physics. So, so I stuck to my thing. Except for that few weeks, I was a little perplexed, you know, having to be forced to take engineering. And it was, I was not very happy, not at so all happy. if you had it. taken their advice very seriously, we would have lost a physicist. Well, I'm not sure because what I've done throughout my life, I... I have not stuck to a particular field. I've looked at problems, real problems, whether it's been nuclear fusion or anything else. And to solve that, it's a multidisciplinary field today. So uh, you know, it's, it's something that you learn how to learn, and you have to do that fast, and then, then not only is possible. See, you, you have uh, switched over from one problem to another problem, one area to another area. Uh, when did you decide that astrophysics and theory of relativity which were very, very difficult areas, both of them highly theoretical areas. Right. When did you decide that that should be your destiny? So actually, I was in Delhi University doing a master's in physics. And that time, a very strong group and very good professors were there at that time. So I was influenced by that. Uh, so I took those courses on general relativity, astrophysics. And on the side, I was also taking particular physics. It's not, uh, I couldn't take all of them together. So I used to just attend the classes as long as I could. But uh, something interesting that I would like to share with you, that when I applied to university in US for PhD, uh, I applied to astrophysics that I'm going to work in this area. And on that basis, they gave me admission. Uh, so I got admission in Berkeley. Fortunately, they also funded me. The last night when I was about to leave country, uh, it was the first flight out of the, that I was taking my life. It was an international flight. At that time, a lot of this was 1981. Were you nervous? Uh, I don't remember being nervous. I was very tired just to do all the you know, travel-related things. And a lot of relatives, friends, everybody had come. At that time, it was a big affair to go abroad. I was sitting in JDU campus. The airport was very close, and I had a few relatives there and so on. One of my uncles asked me, uh, in fact, he funded part of my trip, that what kind of research you are going to do there? It was at that moment, I said that, do I do work on black holes? Is it going to help my country in some way? I responded to him that I'm going to work on either nuclear fusion or space physics. That time I made the switch. Uh, when I was about to leave the country, I felt that I must do something which helps the country. So when I went, joined Berkeley, I was actually given uh, admission on the basis of my interest in astrophysics. I was attending them, but then started to take plasma physics courses. And finally, I moved. The to decision the was taken here, and you started implementing as soon as you reached the right. United States of right. America. Don't go anywhere. I have to take a break. The discussion will continue. Welcome back. Professor Ranjan, you were working on, on cutting edge uh, science and technology at that time. Fusion uh, reaction was a major thing. Right. And people looked forward towards fusion. You were also working on plasma physics and learning at the same time. Why did you decide to come back to India? I wouldn't say that I decided to come back. I never went to stay there. The mint I had gone to do my PhD, it finished. Within a week, I returned back. So there was, at no moment, there was a thought that, that you will stay, stay there. there. Yes. So that thought was never there. So I went. Of course, there were three of us who went from, we were from the same school. All three of us went to IIT Kharagpur. Two of them are in the U.S. and I was the one who came back. The question, one of them, who is Mr. Neeraj Jha, he's in fact professor at Princeton University right now. A few years back, I was visiting him. He asked me this question, that why did you go back? And the answer I gave him is the one that I would like to give you. He, I said that I could have stayed in the U.S. and probably done more research, contributed more to this. But I wanted to contribute to my country. Even if I did less work, it would be something that would be for my society. Did you do less work? I don't think so. No. Okay. I don't think so. When you are happy and satisfied happy. with I'm happy with what whatever I did. work yes. and contribution yes. you have made to the country. Yes, because progress. if I came to research work, it was to have the joy of doing research. 
and not to count uh, you know, on papers, publication, and this and that. I said, I'll do those things which I like doing rather than be forced to do because of other considerations. So when you came back to India, then there was this problem that was there uh, before you that uh, the reactor uh, installed by uh, the, the collaboration with the collaboration of Toshiba. Japanese mm. uh, was not working properly. properly. How did you solve that problem? So actually, I was a modeling person. Uh, uh, I got involved with data acquisition and developing data acquisition system because the system did not come with that. It was very important. I was the one with computer knowledge, so I put my hands in that. And then when data was being acquired, I was too sitting there doing the, when the experiments were being done, I was also sitting there. What was the system. problem? Let's begin with that. So the problem, first, I couldn't understand the problem for quite some time. Nobody in the India had the experience. This was the first reactor being tried out. I did not have a model at that time which I could run on that. So first I had to downsize my model. I developed a new model which was simpler. The complex model would not tell me something. So I developed a simple model. When I ran that, I had more flexibility. I knew the model completely. I had done it myself. I found that normally impurities level we used to put 5-6%. Impurity was, level in the, uh, in the plasma, vacuum? In, so when you create plasma, yeah. from inside the wall, as plasma interacts with, the impurities come into the plasma. If there's too much impurity, it'll quench the plasma in some sense. But normally, the typical standard international plasma would have 5 to 6 percent impurity. The model will put that. When I was putting that, I could not reproduce the behavior. Since I made this little model, which we call zero-dimensional model, I put a lot of impurities. I put 50 percent, 100 percent, 200 percent. Then suddenly, I started to see the behavior of what was being seen coming. Then I realized that impurity is the key problem that I need to solve. And that's how I could identify that. And problem. the Japanese expert did not agree with you uh, initially? Not by the time they had left, actually. Okay. Uh, by the time they had left, they did not guarantee the plasma performance. What they guaranteed was that so much current will flow, so much magnetic field thing. But the outcome of that was not guaranteed. It was part of the contract because it was a research area. Uh, I did help them in some other ways, but I'll not go into that. But then the interesting thing was that I'm a theoretist, theoretic person. Who's going to do the experiment? And my model can only give me indication. Somebody has to do the experiment actually to verify that. Nobody is willing to do that. And then I had to get into experiment. That was again a turning point in your point life that you switched over from theoretical physics to Again, I would not say I switched over. I continued to do that and I continued to do this. Because modeling without being verified is useless. So it has to be practically tried out. If I'm saying something, it has to be tried out to see that actually. Then only my faith in my model increases. So I did not give up anything. I would not use the term switch. I would say that I continue to add many things as needed, right? And do practical things and as, look as at the models. So my how targeted they... research, you know, I have to get the nuclear fusion reactors working, tokamak working, whatever needs to be done, there's experiments, whether it's you know, theory, whether it's modeling, data equation. I said that nothing is untouchable. In the US, you had not worked on tokamak. No, reactor. no, but I was... But here, you had to work on something which was very new to you. Right. In the U.S. also, I did work, but it was a concept of new uh, design of reactor, which combined tokamak and a magnetic mirror machine. And so, I used to talk about what is the bad thing with tokamak, I used to talk about what is the bad thing with mirror, and then to combine that to come up with a new concept, which I call that is a better one. So I was working on reactor. This also helped you to uh, solve many problems at... Uh, um, uh, in Ahmedabad, uh, right. when you switched over from uh, Saha Institute to uh, right. your new institute. Right. So the advantage I had of uh, when I was working in Science of Nuclear Physics, very small machine. Everything you do by yourself, whether you to come, you put on the vacuum systems, everything, power supply, you run by yourself. So, and I had a modeling background. So I understood the system thing, and I had practically so was handling all of this. So when I came to Institute for Plasma Research, actually... Uh, at that time, I was planning to do a superconducting, I would design a superconducting machine. And in Saha Institute, campus was situated very valuable in the cyclotron center. We were the same campus. They were having a superconducting cyclotron plan. So I was thinking that if I can make a superconducting tokamak at that time, it will be, you know, we can, come and share, we can share common facilities. When you came to uh, Indian uh, Institute, Institute of Plasma, of Plasma Research. Research, it was a much bigger facility, but there were certain problems that the team was facing? How did you solve it? Right. That? So the, the, when I joined there, uh, Professor Ko, uh, he was a director at that time, I asked him what I need to do. 
So I was called to actually work with the superconducting machine. He told me, why don't you look at the old machine, which is Aditya, and uh, solve the problems that it is facing. So what used to happen is that the discharge would go up and very quickly you know, Come crash. Down. It would not sustain. And we are talking about nanoseconds. Uh, milliseconds. Really. Milliseconds. Say 20, 30 milliseconds. So designed for about 250 milliseconds. But in 20, 30 milliseconds, it would crash. It would start to go up and down. So I was a little perplexed. I said that, you know, I know the problems with this. A lot of people have tried. Uh, he had called many experts, internal experts, who would stay for one month, two months. Six years had gone, 89, 95 I joined. So I was, I told him that, look, why are you are putting me into, into something that's not working? You'd call me to do this superconducting one. He said, all right, you spend 50, 50 percent time on both. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine. Uh, after two days we met in the corridor, he asked me that, you know, have you found something? He expected that I would find some one missing link that I could do. I said, I have a few things that I would mind. So he said, may you make a presentation. Uh, so the next meeting we had on Monday morning was to a meeting. I made the presentation. Then the existing team told that uh, mostly what he's telling we have tried, it doesn't help. Then he told them that, why don't you let him try? Anyway, it's not working. So after I could not actually get a chance, I'll not go into details, but after about three months' time, finally I got an opportunity to actually try it out. Uh, Monday, uh, I discussed with electrical engineers. We tried a few things. Wednesday, I remember at lunchtime, I went to Professor Kaur. I used to eat lunch in the canteen itself. I told him that I'm changing the way the machine is being run. Instead of trying to go to very high current, I would slow it down and first get a long discharge, and then I will try to push it. He said, that's your call. I'm not going to say your decision. By Friday, it was running. The machine was running. We started to get long discharge. So from Monday to and Friday... everybody was very happy about right, it. Right. Then after a few months, I was made the project leader of that. Uh, I have to take a break. Don't go anywhere. The discussion will continue. Welcome back. Uh, Professor Ranjan, now you have switched over. Uh, I should not be using that <laughs> word. Uh, but you have had your hands right from astrophysics to plasma physics to many inventions which you were interested in, helping those who are uh, challenged, uh, helping the area in the area of agriculture, tracking uh, wildlife. the wildlife moon. or moon mission. Uh, now, you are working in an area which is going to decide the destiny of the country. TIFAC is, is given the mandate to decide what future pursuit of the country should be. Right. Would you like to talk about it? Would you like to say something about the vision that the country should have? Right. So I was fortunate to have joined TIFAC. Uh, finally, I joined the executive director April 2013. So slightly more than two years. Uh, I was not very familiar with TIFAC. And so once I came to know that I would be joining it, I tried to learn about it. Technology Vision 2020 was a work which is well known. Uh, we lost Dr. Kalam a few years back. It was done under his chairmanship. He was our chairman from 93 to 2001. He was very close to TIFAC. And even after he became president, I have a number of stories that scientists have shared with me, how much you know, he was close to TIFAC scientists. He continued to, associate, to be associated with TIFAC. When I joined, by that time, Technology Vision 2035 work was started. It was nearly 20 years back, 95, 96 was done. When I joined, it became my task actually to carry it forward. Now, the Technology Vision 2035 work is a set of 13 documents. There's a vision document and there are 12 sectors roadmaps. The main difference between Technology Vision 2020 work and Technology Vision 2035 work is that Technology Vision 2020 work was for India as a country. Technology Vision 2035 is for Indians as its citizens. The focus is completely different. We are trying to see that we must meet the quality of life requirement of each individual citizen wherever, irrespective of their location, their beliefs, all that is being considered together in this. So we have one vision. Whether they are living on uh, hilly, in hilly areas right. Right. or in plains or coastal right. areas, right. whether they are upper caste, lower caste, right. villagers or right. Right. in, in yes. living in metropolitan towns, yes. every individual should count. 
Right. That is the vision. Right. So the what moment. we have done is that we discuss first people of India, what we visualize them to be. And then we said that if we close our eyes and open it 2035, what do you want to see? Where do we want to, our life to be there at that time? And for each people, we have looked at three aspects. Is it an uh, ideal Indian citizen that we are talking about? Or is it the real Indian uh, who, who lives? It's, it's a real, real Indian. So we have actually divided them into six groups. There are people who are, we call them beehives, 50%, 55%. The people who are globalized, you know, or 30% and so on. These are non-exclusive groups. That means a person could fall into. So when you add up this, there are people who are left behind. There are people with alternative beliefs. So we have covered all of these. We have looked at three aspects, security, prosperity, identity of each of the citizens, their relative needs of this. Then based on that, we have a life escape that we prepared where we said that, what do you want to see at that time? If we close our eyes and open at that time. Then we worked out 12 prerogatives. Six of them are individual and six are collective. Then each of these prerogatives, how to achieve that, we have worked out technology at different stages, technology which is ready to deploy, technology which needs to go from lab to field, technology which needs targeted research, and technology and imagination. Then we are following it with 12 sectorial documents to achieve this vision in different sectors. So this one vision document with 12 sectoral roadmaps is constituting technology vision 2035. Have you also identified the problems why we have not been able to achieve what we want to achieve? Uh, in six years. So what uh, I would like to say that one thing we have done is retrospection for our, of our Technology Vision 2020 document, saying that 20 years back, this is what we had visualized. Where do we stand today? So we have made a, uh, one chapter we've written on this. There's info. Have progress. we made progress in six years? So there are... We are you happy to, and satisfied? We, are, we divide into four groups. One group, we have compared to horses motion. India galloping, India cantering, India tottering, and India walking. Galloping is where we've done better than expected. For example, ICT sector. There are other areas where we have gone along the expected line. There are expected, slightly worse than expected torturing India, and then walking days where we've done worse. So we have been, uh, we have not said that who needs to do what. We have just looked at what we visualized at the time and where do we stand today. That comparison we have done. We did not want to go into specific details because it's a complex thing. You know, like ICT sector, maybe because global technological development made us gallop. It may not be country-specific thing. So we have looked at all that and given a very succinct picture. At the moment, a lot of raw material goes out without value addition. Right. What is the focus at the moment? Are we going to value add or are we going to export a lot of raw material and buy finished product from the yes, so global we, market? We were asked to look into exports. Exports went down for two, three years back, severely about 20-25%. We were asked to look into whether technology infusion can help. And out of that, four sectors are identified. One of them was guar gum. I was very surprised. I was in Gujarat for a long time. We used to use guar beans. I didn't know why we were being asked. When I looked at the data, it was phenomenal. From about 3,000 crores to export, it jumped to 21,000 crore. Slump. And then again, next year, crashed and so on. So when we looked at we prepared the report. Now we understand. We found that we export nearly 80% or more of guar gum worldwide. But when it comes to value addition, it's nearly zero. We looked at the patents. Nearly 12,000 global patents are there. Out of the India's contribution, is less than 1%. Then I said, this is a very alarming situation. This then I went, cannot continue. This cannot continue. I looked into I said, that what is happening with raw material? So now actually working on raw material. I have a list of 792 raw material where India is a major manufacturer uh, or producer. And similarly, there's a list of minerals. But all of this has been going out of the country. Just guar gum. Is a potential of 50,000 crore to 100,000 crore per year. Imagine right. the amount of wealth that we are losing out. So this is a story that Do you, we need to... Are you confident that once the Indian scientific community is called upon to solve such problems, it will stand up? Yes. Actually, and what in, is required? So I have been... Do you want more long. money, more funds to come in, or is, is it a call? that is to be given? I think uh, it's the call that has to be given. We need to, evaluation scheme of the scientist has to focus on targeted research. Uh, right now, we count publications and so on. Nobody looks at what you were supposed to do. Ultimately, uh, what has come out of that research other than right. paper. So if we, I've lived abroad for a long time, I've interacted with this thing. So Indian scientists are you know, nowhere inferior to anybody else. Absolutely. Given a target, I'm sure that they would be able to do it. 
just that we need to define the target, focus on that. I'm sure that that just this raw material thing, if we can just take it up, I'm sure it will change the country completely. It'll change the country. Would you like to give a message to the younger generation? I would say that younger generation I've interacted with, I was a professor for about 11 years. They're uncertain what they want to do. But today, actually, there's tremendous opportunity. Any field that you want to go, they should follow their passion and opportunities to open. But whatever you do, be the best. It does not matter what it is. Whatever you do, be the best. Uh, may I, on your behalf, promise our viewers that you will be happy to answer questions? Sure. sure. Write to us. Our email address is eurekarstv at gmail.com. Next week, we'll be here with another scientist, an outstanding person. Till then, goodbye. Thank you very much for Thank giving you. us time. Thank you.